Hey guys, what's up? Today we're here with the first ever edition of Metagame Mondays. So Metagame Mondays, we're going to be covering a new topic every single Monday in the Metagame. It's going to be a longer video as well, so this video is projected to be anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour long. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be discussing that topic at length. I'm discussing what's good against it or good with it, what's not no good against it, what could be problematic, you know, the whole slew of things. I have my team builder locked and loaded with stuff about a hyper offense, which is going to be our week one topic. Um, basically, we're going to start off this video by going over different Pokemon you could see on hyper offense in the roles. So we're going to start with potential leads and kind of set up to generate the hyper offense momentum. Then we're going to discuss potential abusers of hyper offense, different win conditions and breakers, etc. And then also we're going to discuss problematic matchups. There's a whole slew of them, so yeah. And after that, we might even build a sample team and ladder a couple games to top it all off. So you're getting a full hyper offense experience. And I'm not going to say we're going to do this with different team styles every week because we'd run out of you know things to do after four or five weeks. But I'm going to say we're doing it on different topics, and they're all going to include in-depth analysis. And hyper offense is simply the first one. A lot of people mentioned it in the comments, and I've been using it on the ladder, so to be a great way to start off but yeah so this is going to be metagame mondays guys we're getting this every single monday so let's get started with the first edition okay so as you can see we have a lot of stuff locked and loaded with hyper offense um obviously the obligatory wooloo and whooper but more importantly um we're gonna be discussing leads yeah so let's start off with that um hyper offensive teams of course tend to revolve around getting up hazards or screens or veil in the early game and let me explain why, first and foremost, before we go into them. Basically, in order for certain win conditions, like let's say Bisharp to function, you're going to need hazard damage on certain switch-ins in order to turn one sh two shots into one shots, or three shots into two shots. So basically, let's say I'm doing 45% with a move. If I'm doing 45% with a move, then it's going to live two of them. But if I do 45% and they take the 12.5% damage from Stealth Rock, then all of a sudden it kills them two. Or... If, let's say, I have something like a Belladrum Azumarill, and they have a Hydreigon or a Dragapult, and I Belladrum up, but they're at full health, they're living that plus 6 Aqua Jet, and they have a chance to Revenge Clause with the specific move if we've taken enough chip. However, if this, you know, Belladrum Azumarill gets a couple of Rock Turns on the Dragapult and Hydreigon, which is very easy to do, easy to finesse in those games, then all of a sudden, they're on plus 6 Aqua Jet range, and you could just handily sweep those teams, assuming you're not facing something like an unaware Pokemon, which tends to not be seen on those balance teams with Hydreigon and Dragapult, after all. So hazards and also giving yourself the ability to set up with things like either Sticky Web to make you quicker or Aurora Veil or Light Screen and Reflect to help let you tank more hits is of the utmost importance in hyper offensive teams. In addition to this, those Pokemon not only give you a, a direct lead so you don't have to like play a guessing game because these teams otherwise leading would be a guessing game, but they also mean that you have a fodder at any point in time if you want to reset momentum, which is of the utmost importance as well. While any Pokemon can be used as fodder, Foddering your win conditions tends to not be great in the early game just because one could break things open for another. So let's say your Volcarona doesn't look great on turn one because they have something like a Chansey. If you use something like your Magirna to chip that Chansey or trick that Chansey, or you use something like, say, your Dragapult to lure it in thinking it's special Dragapult, and then you hit it with a plus one Dragon Darts, then all of a sudden that Chansey is either out of commission or it's going to be weak enough to where a plus one Fire Blast can potentially take it out, especially if you have Hazard set up. Because of that, letting go of any win condition prematurely, unless there's something that 100% hard walls it and isn't good against everything else on your team, is probably not for the best. So foddering off your leads and saving them, basically, to only set up hazards and just generate early game momentum is of the utmost importance. Um, because of that, I think that picking the right lead for your hyper-offensive team is a topic that we really need to dive into here. So let's go ahead and go for it. Now, they're in order of most common all the way to least common, and there's even other fringe leads as well. Like, for example, we showcase a lead... Sorry about that. We showcased a lead um, Focus Sash Mamoswine alive prior to DLC, and that's really cool too because it brings you down to Sash you could use Endeavor, so it could help cripple things that could potentially be defoggers or checks your win conditions. And it's unaware, it's not impacted by Taunt due to its ability, Oblivious. So there's a lot of pros and cons of each lead. However, the one that's the most common in my opinion, and also the most effective in my opinion, would have to be Extra Drill. And here is why. Excadrill's lead set is really good in the metagame because not only does it access to Stealth Rock, which means that you can set up Stealth Rock's hand lead, but also does access to two moves that are very important on your utility end. The first one is Rapid Spin. Hyper offensive teams tend to be kind of strapped against hazards, in particular if you don't have a lot of heavy duty boots Pokemon like Volcarona. Um, 
especially Toxic Spikes. They could just status pretty much four or five members in every upper offensive team. Not only is Extra immune to Toxic Spikes, but also it's capable of coming in against Toxic Spikes, threatening it with a super effective Earthquake, and getting a rapid spin off on it. Even if it's only a one-time thing, as your Extra is likely not going to be living in the long haul when it's such an offensive variant of it, and it's not paired with any support defensively. Um, that's all you need, because you're not going to be letting these Pokemon in repeatedly. These games are meant to be rapid fire. You're meant to win these games within the first, you know, 20, 30 turns, if you will. It's a completely different approach to your normal balance and maybe kind of prolonged, fatter play. But it is a very effective one at that, in at times and in moderation. Um, another tech of Exodrill is the fact that it has Steel Beam. So let's say I'm facing a team that lacks Toxic Spikes or something that I need to preserve my Exodrill for. So turn one, I click Stealth Rocks against a Corviknight or a Mandibuzz. And they use Foul Play if you're Mandibuzz or Body Press if you're Corviknight. And they bring me down to, let's say, you know, 20, 30, 40%, whatever it may be. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, damn, I'm under half health. They have Defog, and I can't do anything to them. But even a weak Iron Head would only be able to just scratch the surface on Mandibuzz, let alone even chip the Corviknight. Because of that, I would go for Steel Beam. Steel Beam could potentially prevent them from getting a Defog off, and then let me bring in something like my Belly Drum Azumarill to threaten them from Defogging, or my Bisharp to say, okay, if your Mandibuzz wants to Defog in my face, I'm going to hit it with a plus two attack. You alternatively could just go hard Bisharp as well, but you got to watch out because Foul Play actually does a decent chunk of damage. And some run creep for Bisharp. On top of that, it's also great if you want to fire it off for momentum, but they're trying to set up something like, say, a Commander or Nicholas, and you're like, nope. Or an Iron Defense Magirna in Grassy Train, nope. You could just make sure you fire yourself up and get your win condition as quick as possible. It makes the foddering process escalated drastically. It gives them something kind of like an explosion that, unfortunately, not a lot of Suicide Leaps have access to besides Mew, and Mew prefers Flare Blitz to Threaten Corviknight and Opposing Exedrill. So. Yeah, I think this makes Exodrill universally regarded as the most common lead on these hyper-offensive teams. Of course, though, there are other options, and let's delve into those other options. The first one that comes to mind, and perhaps the second most common one, is Mew. With the nice natural bulk it has, coupled with the fact that it can afford to earn max HP, you are able to stomach most hits barring things like a Choice Expanded Urshifu or a Choice Specs Dragapult. And even then, Shadow Ball, um, I don't think always kills if it's timid. If it's modest, I think it's a very favorable role if it doesn't always kill, but that aside, you're able to stomach, insert any hit from non Urshifu pretty much, live that, force them out with red card, get rocks up, and there's a good chance that you're faster than four or five Pokemon on every single team, so you're likely able to get spikes up as well. If they go to the Corviknight or Mandibuzz, not only do you have Taunt, but you also have Flare Blitz to help potentially kill yourself if you're weakened, um, or do a lot of damage to the Corviknight, and another remover in Extra Drill, so that's pretty helpful as well. Some people have run Attack Investment to help escalate the damage against Corviknight into a kill range and drill, potentially killing offensive sets some of the time, but again, it's really, I prefer max HP just for some bulk purposes, for letting you pivot into some things. Also, um, personally, I love saving Mew against teams with Amoongus and using it to sacrifice it to sleep. Same goes for most leaps, honestly. Um, what else am I thinking about here? Oh, um, right. On top of that, Mew, um, with red card can potentially be your best friend if it brings you out to something like on the more passive side of the spectrum. However, if it uses something a bit more, um, if it brings in something faster or something like Urshifu on the red card, then it can admittedly not be as ideal. So people have used other things on it, such as type resistance berries. And um, I guess running no item, actually no, I'd run casted berry over no item because that helps with Dragapult as well. But yeah, they can help live a hit from Marowak as well. Um, as an adamant flare blitz, I don't believe it kills you with max HP. So yeah, and you could of course tinker with this bread, run more attack, run more HP, or even specialize in a specific defense to have a specific hit. As for the speed though, I'd always run max speed or at least outrun Urshifu to get Stealth Rocks up turn 1 against those teams at least and make sure it's locked into Wicked Blow. But yeah, um, have it your way I suppose. But yeah, Mew, Mew is just really great. It gets access to spikes, which is just new to this generation and honestly makes it a leg up against Extra Drill in terms of pure hazard setup. The only issue is it lacks rapid spin and the same offensive presence. So yeah, you kind of you know pick your pick your battles if you will. Next off, we have Terrakion, which I must admit can use um, Swords Dance or Earthquake or Rock Tomb over the um, Taunt in the fourth slot. But I personally prefer this setup. Um, it's a really threatening lead. It's always going to be forcing some sort of damage, and also with Taunt in the speed it has, it's preventing opposing hyper offensive teams. For example, um, you could Taunt the Mew on turn one or something along those lines. Um, yeah, that's really important. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically, Terrakion is just a really versatile offensive lead. Um, again, over Taunt, you could run Earthquake, Rock Tomb, um, Swords Dance potentially. It helps chipping things like a Pow Down for, I've mentioned, like Bisharp or Cinderace type Pokemon. Um, I've also seen Double Kick on it. 
I guess that's cool for some sash leads, but I don't even know if it gets to one shot on things like extra. I'd have to calculate that. It's more of an Uber's thing. Um, Toxic's fine as well. But yeah, Stealth Rock plus the dual stab just makes it really threatening. Unfortunately, in the metagame with more and more Slowbro, Tangrowth, and a Powdown, there's some effect, but you do have one really great matchup, and that's against Mandibuzz, the most common defogger right now. So I'd say Tracheon is um, the third most common and effective lead. Of course, though, Shuckle um, fits a completely different team archetype, and that's stuff number four. Um, it runs Sticky Web, of course, so that's going to work on Sticky Web teams in particular. Like, for example, that x team I used in the live a while back, um, of course, it used Shuckle, because in my opinion, is the best Sticky Web setter, but just to discuss Sticky Web as a whole, basically, it helps slow down the opponent, but it's even more conscious of Defog, because once it's removed, you know, it's removed, and your team kind of relies on that more than any other team relies on individual other hazard, because the speed is something you kind of plan around. Um, because of that, um, using other sticky web setters, if your team kind of fits another rocker, could maybe decompress you a little bit. So some other examples of that could be a Raquanid, or Rebombi, or even Slurpuff. Just some examples. But I prefer Shuckle. It compresses with rocks and has amazing bulk that can come repeatedly. And also it's Encore Infestation. Yeah, it's a really weird Pokemon to see OU, but it is in fact OU by usage. So I think that shows how much it's caught on. And I mean... I'd like to say that my channel and Xbox team is actually like half the usage of it uh, nowadays because we see a ton of that team on the ladder, honestly. I faced it repeatedly, but yeah, um, I, I love having that influence on people. I love that. But anyway, Shuckle's great. Um, I mean, just look at the defense stats. It's kind of laughable. It's 614 base defense without like anything else. It's the highest base defense of anything in the game, I believe. So yeah, um, Shuckle, Sticky Webs, it's pretty solid. But again, it's kind of cheesy in the sense that you're not going to always get the bang for your buck, especially if they have the right hazard removal and they play it right. So it comes down to a few crucial turns that determine each game. And personally, I don't love using that in more like competitive arenas, but on the ladder, I think it's pretty cool. Next up, we have Ninetales. I don't love Encore. I love Safeguard. Yeah, um, so basically, there are a lot of possible moves here that you could use. This shouldn't be Aurora Beam. No, 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 no. It should be Aurora Veil. Um, but basically, on Veil teams, Ninetales Alola is... Essentially staple status, I'd say. Um, hmm. Let me pause for one sec. But, um, yeah, I'm back. Sorry. Um, Aura Veil is just really great on Ninetales teams, of course. It's really the only reason to use it, honestly. I've seen people use, like, the nasty plot sets on the ladder, but it's just so weak. It only has base 81 special attack, and despite having nice base 109 speed, which helps out running things like Keldeo, Terrakion, Base 105s, Adamant Cinderace, uh, Base 100s, etc. Um, you just really struggle with doing any damage. So Aura Veil is kind of its own archetype, though, that validates Ninetales' legitimate OU Pokemon. Basically, Light Screen and Reflect combined. Um, yeah, all damage is half, which is just really cool. Of course, it can only be set up with Hail. So let's say you lead with your Hail Inducer and then you go for Aura Veil, but they switch to Tyranitar or Palipper or Torkoal. It's a risky proposition because... Um, Tyranitar and Hippowdon take super effective damage from stabs, respectively, because some people run Moonblast over Hypnosis or Safeguard. Um, Palper is just dying the freeze dry, but Torkoal can come in safely at least. So yeah, um, you gotta risk it a little bit, but ultimately, um, Orville, once it's set up, is great for those teams. The thing is that Ninetales is completely wasted slot aside from that. It's just not really useful, so try and maximize utility by getting things like Hypnosis on it and Safeguard block status, I guess, or you run Encore to try and come in at the right time. I suppose, Disable. Yeah, yeah, some other moves, Seal Bell. I mean, yeah, it could run stuff, but it's just not really great. Triple Axe, I wonder if Triple Axe is strong. No, 67 attack, never mind. <laughs> Having a chance to miss as well. Anyway, um, on that note, there's also screens teams with, you know, Reflect, Light Screen, Prankster, Grimmsnarl, which is seen as more consistent than Ninetales, just because it's a bit of a better Pokemon. And also with Spirit Break, it does great against Defoggers, um, which is really cool. Well, in particular, Mandibuzz, so this spread lets you always to kill Mandibuzz, I believe. And despite you and Prankster, so you can't taunt it, that's enough damage to, you know, out-damage Roost, which is really helpful, even if you're running Fizzle Offensive, I believe. Um, just with all these things considered, I'd say that Grim's Gnarl is a bit better than Ninetales, and hindsight, I'm going to actually move it ahead of that. But there's still some inherent limitations of Grim's Gnarl that you got to be cautious of. For example, it lets things like Exodrill set up on you, so you can't really be too cautious of that. Anyway, um, hmm. I, I'd have to say that of all of these, my favorite, of course, is Exodrill. But honestly, I don't think Mew is much better than Trachyon or Shuckle. But then I think that once these pass, I think that like Screen Teams is a completely different tier of Hyper Offense. And you kind of have to be cautious about how you approach that. So I'd say all in all, if you're kind of a beginner to Hyper Offensive Teams, try using one of the first four leads. Sticky Webs is particular only if you like Shuckle. Sorry, Shuckle in particular only if you want Sticky Webs. 
But yeah, um, getting Stealth Rock up and really understanding how you can abuse that and the potential fodder purposes of all these leads afterwards is just kind of fundamental using hyper offensive teams. And then once you've gotten the hang of that, then I'd recommend trying out Grim's Gnarl or Nine Tails and kind of seeing what you could do with this different support. The issue is that those require a second Pokemon for Stealth Rocks. So all of a sudden, instead of using five win conditions, you're not only four deep, and that can limit you not only offensively, but also in terms of how you can cover and offensively check things defensively, because you still need to make sure you don't lose before you win with hyper offense, if that makes sense. You need to make sure that you're not like getting shut out. So that's another important aspect of hyper offense that we're going to get to once we discuss the different Pokemon that fit on hyper offense offensively as pencil breakers and win conditions. So I have like four different tiers of potential. I, I call them sweeping options, but really you could call them wind conditions slash breakers. Um, if you don't know what a wind condition is, I made a whole video on wind conditions in SSOU. I'll try and remember to link it in the description as I normally do. But basically it's a Pokemon that can be used to win the game under certain circumstances or conditions. You have to do some setting up sometimes or other matchups. It just looks amazing from the get go. But regardless of that, Basically, the idea of the core of hyper offensive teams is to use one win condition to just set up for another win condition until one of them ultimately does what win conditions do and wins the game. Sometimes it takes some switching or some creativity within the mix, but a lot of times these Pokemon have some synergy or the ability to work together well that's built in. For example, let's say you use Exedrill plus Bisharp plus Belladrum Azumarill. You can set up Stealth Rock with Exedrill. All of a sudden, that's going to chip the aforementioned checks to Azumarill, such as Hydreigon, Dragapult, you know, Fast Pokemon, Rillaboom, and that's great. So all of a sudden, they're taking Rock damage repeatedly, and then you could be in plus six Aqua Jet range. Alternatively, though, let's say that someone tries and defogs away those rocks to help deter the Azumarill sweep. On the defog, you can go to Bisharp and get plus two. And let's say you're against the Corviknight and they have Body Press, so they still live a plus two knockoff and weaken you all the way down. The thing is that if you have another Pokemon that could set up that takes advantage of the, you know, Corviknight or Mandibuzz being weakened, such as Rillaboom or Halucha or even both of them, then all of a sudden you're going to do really well off in the long haul because you weakened the main check. Even if that took a Pokemon to do so, that trade is oftentimes worthwhile. Sometimes trading a full Pokemon for 80% or 75% of a Pokemon to put it in range for another Pokemon is completely worthwhile. And that's something that you got to be... Acknowledgement. You gotta acknowledge because sometimes those trades with normal teams don't feel right because you feel like you're not getting the bang for your buck. But with these teams, at the end of the day, it can be work. And here's an example: a team that we're actually gonna play with a bit later. Um, in fact, I'm using it in my live later today. Is um, a grassy slide hyper offensive team, and you're going to basically be setting up Stealth Rock with Excadrill, and then let's say they go to the Defogger, and all of a sudden you can't, you know, get the rocks to muscle through Cinderace or Drag Pulse checks. But then you can use Bishop to get plus two and beat the Defoggers down, and then things like say Rillaboom, which matches the Poilu with flying types like Corviknight, Togekiss, um, and more importantly Mandibuzz, is going to go off. Same with Halucha, which loses to Brave Bird Corviknight or Brave Bird Mandibuzz potentially. Um, so yeah, they all really synergize with each other, and I think that's just of the utmost importance. These teams really rely on that built-in synergy. So I definitely keep that in mind. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think that we are going to go through... We're gonna go through these four different like tiers, I guess you could say. Um, I just kind of basically spread it out by viability. So for instance, I believe that part one is the best like six win conditions for hyper offense, but that doesn't mean they work well together. That just means like standalone, they're the most effective. Next six, then the next six, then kind of six more fringe options. As you see, we get all the way down to things like Explod and Silvali Ghost, which we've used in this channel. So yeah, I'd say for beginners, I'd try and stick to the first two tiers and maybe like the first half of the third tier. But admittedly, Diving down isn't a bad thing, it just takes more specific team building and approach within the game as these Pokemon do have some inherent trade-offs. Of course, every Pokemon has pros and cons. If a Pokemon had no cons using it, then it'd probably be too good or just use all the time. Clefable moment. Um, so you gotta be careful of that, but ultimately I, I think that there's enough kind of respect for these Pokemon to where there's a rough sense of what tiers they belong in, in this like whole hyper-offensive spectrum. So let's go to tier one. Um, we have Pokemon such as Bisharp, Azumarill, Dragapult, Magearna, Holucha, and Volcarona. Um, Bisharp is kind of like, it's, it's great on hyper offense. It's a hyper offensive Pokemon in a lot of senses. That's because of the ability to Defiant. So it could come in on a Defog and really punish people for trying to punish your Suicide Leads, your Mew, your Exodile, your Tracheon. And it's gonna get plus two attack when you use Defog and then it could just slaughter things. It could potentially sweep teams. It's also just great in general because it has priority. Priority is something that's really good on hyper offensive teams. Priority, or those of you who don't know, is moves that always go first, such as Sucker Punch, Aqua Jet, etc. 
Um, Priority Sucker Punch is amazing against opposing offensive teams and faster Pokemon, which can otherwise shut down your sweep of slower Pokemon like Bisharp. And Azumarill is the same with Aqua Jet. So that's a really nice weapon to have. It's great against things like Dragapult, Cinderace, Alakazam, Excadrill, Weakened Hydreigon or Heracross, um, yeah, etc. The thing is, unfortunately, in this metagame, there's this Pokemon Urshifu, which four times resists Sucker Punch and is quicker and can one-shot you. So that's unfortunately been a roadblock to Bisharp and Hyper Offense lately, but I'd still say it's one of the top dogs in approaching staple status just because even if um, Urshifu can check you, if you come in on a Defog and then you Iron Hit predicting the switch or you Iron Hit into Mandibuzz because Mandibuzz is way more common than Corviknight right now, then all of a sudden, plus two Iron Hit and the plus two Sucker Punch still kills a Shifu because plus two Iron Hit is still doing a million damage because you're still 125 base attack Bisharp with max attack and Adamant. Even if you're not Life Orb or Black Glasses boosts because you're Iron Heading, it's, you know, it's still great. Um, Life Orb is an alternative item, by the way, but I much prefer Black Glasses. Not taking recoil is huge. Um, anyway, so yeah, kind of trading with Corviknight is also really important because that means something like Halucha or Dragon Dance Dragapult or Rillaboom later on can really do well, or you can get your rocks up with extra later on if you preserve that extra drill. So, yeah, I definitely think that's worth noting. But anyway, um, that aside, it's also really good at chipping things like Hippowdon, which, again, can stop things like Halucha and Zera Aura, or it could even use Whirlwind as other things try and set up, so definitely worth noting as well. Next up, we have Azumarill. Azumarill has been a new Pokemon in the metagame, um, but the Belladrum set fits in perfectly well on hyper-offensive teams. I even used it on a prior live, so definitely check that out. But that aside, um, Belladrum Azumarill is great because your typical checks to Azumarill, like offensive checks, like defensive checks to it, for example, things like Amoongus, Tangrowth, Slowbro, Toxapex, um, you could go down the list. All of them are dying to plus six attacks, and getting a Belladrum up with hyper offense is pretty easy. You just got to lure in the right thing to kill your other one condition that would give you a setup turn. So, for example, it could be Corviknight, it could be, um, and it could be um, a Volcarona. It could be a Chansey or a Blissey. It could be um, a Power Whipless Ferrothorn. Although it's kind of dicey if it leads to you. But yeah, it could be um, a, a Pelipper on Rain Team. So yeah, I mean, just finding an alley to set up is not hard, in my opinion. Sometimes it takes a little work, a little baiting, but you should always be able to do that by the end of the game for sure. And then Aqua Jet's plus six priority, it's just so strong. Even if you're not necessarily killing more than one thing, normally they have to go to a defensive measure or a fodder just to make sure they don't like switch their like, Hydreigon or Dragapult into knock off or play rough. And then after that, so they lose one thing, and then you get a lot of chip on the other thing. And that's just, usually that's a worthwhile trade alone, but you could use it as a win condition itself if you're able to weaken that faster Pokemon, like that Dragapult, and then just sweep with Aqua Jet. Or if you're healthy enough to where they can't kill you with their Hex or their Steel Wing if they're the Dragon Darts variant. So yeah, um, in a way, a lot of Dragapult sets can't actually take you out, which is also really cool and helpful. Same with Hydreigon, but again, there are certain variants that are able to handle you, so you gotta be careful. And you gotta sometimes accept the fact you're only gonna be trading, you know, one Pokemon or one and a half Pokemon for an Azumarill, which again is still more than enough to help set up for other Pokemon. It's all like these Pokemon are just breaking for each other. That's the beauty of it. And in a way, that takes a lot of planning and, and kind of, you know, long-term thought. But um, but there, it's a lot, of, a lot of high upside stuff as well. Next off, we have Dragapult, a Pokemon that I've ranted and raved about for a long time in Hyper Offense. I love this set because you can Fire Blast things like Skarmory, Corviknight, Magearna, Tangrowth, etc. And that's great. But also, things like Chansey, I think they could wall you. Nope. Dragon Darks is doing a million. Sorry, Dragon Darks is doing a million. I kind of just yawned as I said that. Oh my god. That's unprofessional. But yeah, um, there's definitely a ton of upside to that. Um, and Steel Wing is great because plus one is able to one shot. Uh, now, unfortunately, decreasingly common, especially defensive Clefable. It's also good for other um, fire types as well. I guess it's the most damage you could do to Azumarill. Hatterene is great against, and Hatterene can cock block things like Mew and potentially even Drakion, so you gotta be careful there as well. But um, yeah, no, so this is a really cool set, and it's also just like the fastest thing you're gonna be using on a lot of these teams, so it could be a natural revenge killer to things like Corbin Dance Volcarona too, because it resists both stabs, and also just revenge kill things like Alakazam, which could be annoying to you, Cinderace, Slack Sucker Punch, etc. Next up, we have Magearna. There are a million sets you could use. This is one example. It can, of course, run three attacks. It could run different attacks. It could run iron defense, etc. Weakness policy is really great, particularly with screens. So I definitely would recommend using that. Um, this spread in particular, make sure you're always living a hit from our Shifu, but you could do a million things with the spread and the move, um, the spreads and moves. So yeah, I just think Magearna is just so great, and it fits on a lot of hyper offensive teams, not all of them, but it also gives you a resist to a lot of different typings, which can come in handy in a pinch if need be. Um, it's resistant to Dark, it's resistant to Fairy, Psychic, um, 
grass, you know, you can go on and on normal. Yeah, so there's a lot of things this does well against. Of course, it can only do so much with four moves and so many EVs and one item, but you can make the most of it and kind of fit it specifically to your team to what you want to lure in maybe. So definitely be cautious of A, facing it and B, using it on your hyper offensive teams. Next up, we have Halucha. Halucha is a great option it, with Unburden and the help of Brassy Seed on um, teams with Rillaboom, which we'll get to in a minute. Or you could run the set with um, Sky Attack and Power Herb. can also work standalone regardless of that. So yeah, Halucha and Unburden makes it faster and everything, which is great for revenge killing things like Volcarona or Alakazam, which could be problematic. But also, it's just amazing sweeper. We actually are going to be featuring it in the um, thumbnail of the live later today. Halucha dabs on them haters, so a little spoiler alert there. But yeah, um, it's just naturally a great Pokemon Hyper Offense. I definitely would recommend trying it out, especially with Terrain now being a bit more common in the metagame because it could abuse the Siege. So yeah, next up we have Heavy Duty Boot Fulcarona. Um, I mean, it can of course work on bulky offense or even regular offensive teams, but Hyper Offense can work with it well. Um, while it is stonewalled by things like Chansey, um, you can kind of take advantage of that, pick things that abuse Chansey. So basically you could go Volcarona, lure in the Chansey and then double into something like Halucha or Bisharp or Azumarill. So there's a ton of upside there, and of course then there's the other way around where you can just use a spam of special attackers to potentially cripple and our beat Chansey in a long haul and then win with Volcarona. So yeah, there's a lot of things you could do with it on various sides of the spectrum. I definitely would recommend trying out Volcarona and let me know what you think of that. Um, yeah, anyway, let's get into part two. We also have... Um, so the thing with Rillaboom is I personally love Choice Pant. I think it's the best set by a long shot, but on Hyper Offense, using Choice Users isn't always ideal, especially if they're not like things that like can like sweep to win the game with a specific spamble choice set move. And since grass has so many natural resistances, I personally have been loving a life orb set with Swords Dance and U-Turn. Um, so in general, I'd recommend Choice Band, but on Hyper Offense, I think I'd slightly recommend the Life Orb Swords Dance set. But U-Turn still remains retains momentum, so you could U-Turn on things like Corviknight and things like um, Mandibuzz, or you could U-Turn on potential other checks to bring in things like your Halucha. So let's say to go to Tangrowth or Amoongus, you could U-Turn into Halucha, and then you're like, okay, match set point and oh by the way speaking of halucha before i forget you could also run moves like roost over substitute or taunt over substitute just just a heads up but anyway yeah rillaboom is great it synergizes specifically well with halucha but also teams with a lot of grounded sweepers can appreciate the grassy drain especially things weak to earthquake so things like magirna um can also run grassy seed on certain power sets it's cool um, so yeah, it's a lot of practical applications here, but itself isn't the most amazing Pokemon. It's more of the supportive element of it that makes it shine on these teams. Although Priority Grassy Glide has made it a lot more independently good, in my opinion, as well. Next up, we have Cinderace, the fellow starter Pokemon. I rank it just below Rillaboom and Hyper Offense, but honestly, I could see it being just above it as well. It's just I ranked Halucha so high, and it tends to use on Halucha teams. So yeah, I'll be featuring all three of Halucha, Rillaboom, and Cinderace on my live later today. But Anyway, um, Cinderace is just a superb option. Personally, I've been preferring the Adamant set with Sucker Punch lately, um, just because you want to be able to revenge kill things like Dragapult and Alakazam, because you're slower than them both naturally. And on top of that, you aren't really encountering as many Terrakion barring lead sets, and Kelly are almost all Scarf Flip Turn. So yeah, you don't really have much in the speed turn between. Unfortunately, it leaves you slower than Ninetales and Lola, but that aside, um, you really don't matter with much in terms of speed tiers, and Ninetales is used so um, sporadically that. I don't think that's worth making it plus speed for a loan. So yeah, um, in this spread in particular, it's cool because let's see you face an Azumarill. Turn turn one of that matchup, Cinderace, Azumarill, both at full health. They're going to Belladrum in all likelihood because you don't run Gunk Shot a lot of the time. Because um, Gunk Shot, Cinderace kind of sucks in my opinion. It doesn't really hit much. I mean, you're nuking other things like um, Clefable with Pyro Balls anyway. So yeah, that happens. And then let's say you um, you go for the bulk up as they go for the Belladrum. You're now fighting type and you live a plus six aqua jet with your plus one defense 100 percent of the time with this spread in particular and you're barely cutting out any attack because you're already adamant you're already stronger than a plus speed attack so yeah um this works wonderfully and you still creep base 100 so again you're really not missing much that you already wouldn't be missing due to going adamant so i think it's just the best cinderace for hyper offensive teams but um there are a lot of different things you can do with it. you can do like work up with electro ball as well to help hit things like palper and slow bro so definitely try those out guys um there's a lot of things you could do with it Next up, we have Aegislash. Aegislash is a pretty cool option in the metagame, but unfortunately, it has seen better days due to the prominence of Mandibuzz. Because of that, I would use plus speed on it. In fact, I'd even consider using Head Smash over Shadow Claw or Close Combat just to help with things like that Mandibuzz and also getting a one-shot on an incoming Volcarona, potentially. Um, with that said, though, Swords Dance is still a classic good Pokemon against Sand with Excadrill. Oh, sorry about that. Sand with Excadrill. Um, and it also is just really tanky. In general and can abuse specific matchups of course though um 
Mandibuzz shuts it down. Um, once the balloon's broken, things like a power down can also be really good against it. So you gotta be careful, but it is still an effective option, and I'd say that's great. You could also try automized sets. I love automized plus destiny bond, because you could be quicker and then use an attack as they go to say their check, and then just destiny bond into say the mandibuzz or the dragapult. Well, not the dragapult, you just kill the dragapult. What am I saying? The mandibuzz or the incineroar or the you know crowdon or whatever you want it to be that you're kind of resisting Cinderace. And then that Pokemon is gone, you trade with them, and then other Pokemon can abuse their presence being gone. And that's an amazing synergy of Aegisloss plus insert other breaker as well. So that's cool. Next up we have Zero Aura, which has unfortunately fallen off a little bit due to the prominence of Tangrowth and Powdon and Amoongus above all else. Um, but bulk up sets are still solid. If you have enough Pokemon to deter the grass types, then it can work really well. I'd say i try it out. You could also use Volt Switch over Bulk Up, potentially, but you lose the sleeping presence of it, so then it's more of just a synergetic option. But since it does well against both Defoggers, I think that's actually okay. You could even run Life Orb or Magnet as well. And you can even run Calm Mind if you're really paranoid of a Powdown and Physically Defensive Tangrowth, because then you could kind of destroy them, and that could open up for things like Bisharp. So yeah, it, it's really got a lot of options you could use, but it definitely has seen better days. Next up, we have Necrozma, which with the Prism Armor ability and potential screen support, can abuse a weakness policy, automize calm mindset a lot, and this coverage is great against everything not named Mandibuzz. So yeah, unfortunately the rise of Mandibuzz kind of made this decline, but we've actually seen sets with three attacks that have Power Gem as well. The thing is that then you lose out on either Automize or Combine, so you need your weakness policy to proc to be stronger, or you need sticky weapons to be quick enough. So it is very support oriented, but Necrozma has amazing upside and a lot of built-in versatility. This friend in particular always lives a Scarf or a non-banded Wicked Blow, and it still has enough speed for a plus speed Magirna. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And last but not least, in the second part, we also have Crodon, which is just a really potent Pokemon. It's used a bit more in rain hyper offense, but in general, it's still good because it's strong priority and the ability to break through cores like Slowbro plus Tangrowth or Toxpex plus, you know, Azumungus, you know, those kind of cores um, are actually vice versa because you don't use both poison types together. You use really one of Amoongus or Toxpex plus the other grass to squatter type on those cores a lot. It also punishes Mandibuzz, although Mandibuzz can be quicker than Adamant and should be quicker than Adamant if it outspeeds Aegislash. You can run um, Jolly on it as well, so keep that in mind. And um, U-Turn's not even going to 2 kill you. Foul play will actually do about as much as U-Turn, even more than it potentially, especially if you got a Swords Dance up. But you can still 2 kill it with Crab Hammer always and leave it weakened, so that's cool. Um, yeah, anyway, next off we have Tier 3. Um, yeah, just got to go back to the list. Um, yeah, so in the third part, these are more fringe options, but they definitely retain a lot of viability in the metagame. Um, Togekiss, I have used this spread to always live two hits, two stab hits from her Shifu, specifically two um, Wicked Blows, because close combat's four times resisted, yeah. Um, but it's really great, because it's not on the ground, so it's able to kind of set up on things like Toxic and Powdown, and really also just flinch through teams. It kind of gives you like a last ditch effort, especially if you've weakened specific special checks. Like, for example, Rotom Heat tends to like, come in and try and like revenge shield things like Bisharp or you know um say Cinderace yeah Cinderace is a really great one that pairs well with Togekiss and the fact of the matter is that yeah it can actually win those 1v1s especially if it has the right moves or the right spread but you got to be really careful um and with Rotom Heat weakened then all of a sudden Togekiss can just rampage through a lot of teams a lot of teams just aren't preparing for it either nowadays like they're just using a faster Pokemon like Dragapult to try and revenge kill it which can be cool especially if you expect Thunder or expect Shadow Ball or Steel Wing in the physical end, but it's not enough to kill you, and if it gets a nasty plot up, then you can forget about it. Um, so yeah, I think Tokus is a really interesting option, but it still is pretty niche. You can run Heavy Duty Boots over Leftovers as well. Um, I just prefer to suffocate South Arc from getting up and keeping Leftovers, because I'm sub. But yeah, you could also run Roost, or even Dazzling Gleam, I guess. There are different options um, over Substitute. Next up, we have Heracross, Pokemon I showcased on the x team. Um, Sword Dance Heracross is really devastating. You could also run Spikes over Sword Dance, though, if you're less worried about breaking through cores and more worried about getting hazards up. But again, you lose susceptible to Defoggers because you don't kill Corviknight or Mandibuzz in one hit. So I prefer to Sword Dance to break through them and Slowbro, Tox Specs, you know, etc. You could also use Megahorn, I guess. But yeah, this is my favorite set. Um, the coverage hits everything. It allows for so many mid-ground possibilities. For example, Facade against Fire types, but also just... Hitting things in general like Slowbro and Tangrowth really hard. Close combat for Steel types and, of course, Dark types, killing them in one hit. Knockoff is amazing to Dragapult in one shot and also Aegis Slash as well. You can run Earthquake for Toxics, but Facade's always too a killing special defensive variants, which is kind of common anyway, so Sword Sense Facade is just as good at dealing with that. And Knockoff also hit lets you hit Ghost, so I prefer this. Speaking of Ghosts, though, Gengar is the next Pokemon. It's more of a standalone breaker on, you know, balance and bulky offensive teams, but, um, 
It definitely can work on hyper offense. It's a spin blocker and also a plus two can lure and kill on things like special defensive Corviknight and Mandibuzz with Thunderbolt. So a lot of appeal there. You can also run Focus Blast if you're trying to take down Sand teams, getting a one shot on Drill and Tyranitar. So yeah, there's a lot of merit there. Definitely let me know what you think of Gengar. I think it's a really underrated option on hyper offense. But after that, we get to some more cheesy options like Cloyster and Mimikyu. Um, Cloyster in particular is like the king of cheese because you're basically relying on flinches to break through teams because you're not you don't have the power to like brute force through a lot of walls like Ferrothorn, Slowbro, Corviknight, etc. So yeah, that and lack of special buff is kind of crippling. But hmm. you normally can find a setup turn against a bulkier Pokemon. And in addition to that, it's just one flinch away from winning a lot of games. So there's a ton of upside there. There's just also some downside. It's really great in particular with screens, I'd say. So try and fit that on your screen teams if you want to use something a bit cheesier and a bit more fun. I wouldn't advise using it in a serious capacity in this current metagame with all the slow bro and talk specs around. But hey, to each their own. It definitely saw its high heights in the pre-DLC metagame. So and you can definitely justify it, I'd say. Next up, we have Hydreigon. Again, like Gengar, a Pokemon you see more in balance and bulky offensive teams is a nasty plot breaker, but it can function on hyper offense as it just is so much nuking power that, say, you want to use Volcarona as well. Using this is cool because you could use plus four Draco into Chansey, just completely obliterated or leave it low. You could even win that 1v1, so yeah. And with Sticky Webs, it's actually really cool because it can outrun a lot of things like Dragapult and Volcarona, not Volcarona, and Alakazam that you otherwise wouldn't. So there's definitely a ton of upside there, especially with the lack of high jump kick Cinderace, so. Yeah, if Cinderace isn't running high jump kick, then U-turn can't one-shot you if it is running U-turn, and you could actually potentially win that 1v1 as well. So there's definitely some pluses there. Next up, we have Mimikyu, Modern Art Mimikyu, if you're Yo Mortis, uh, my boy. But yeah, um, I don't think it's unfortunately a very modern pick in the metagame um, due to the fact that Disguise is pretty much all that's going for it. It's really weak with, I believe, basically 90 attack, and even if you pump into Adamant Nature, it's still only hitting 306. At plus 2, it's not even able to 2-kill a power down always, among other things. Very easy for his top picks to beat, even if it's also defensive. Lie a lot on Shadow Claw Chris to break through things. And um, Shadow Sneak is cool for things like Alakazam, Revenge Killing, things like Volcarona, etc. Especially with Disguise being there, so you could even switch in. But aside from Disguise essentially giving you like a free like focus sash, but you're still like well and comfortably alive. Um, it's just it's really frail with 55, 80, 105 defenses. It's really weak, so you kind of have to pick your spots with it. I wouldn't use it seriously, but I guess if you're like really desperate for it, using it, then you can make it work. So, yeah, I guess Mimikyu is an option as well. I think it's above the Pokemon we're going to discussing in Tier 4, at least Part 4, rather. Um, those Pokemon are Diggersby, Gyarados, Alakazam, Exploit, Savali Coast, and Scizor. Um, Diggersby is, like, the most legitimate of all of them. It's really strong with Swords Dance Quick Attack. It's pretty much only, like, destroyed by Dragapult because Dragapult can revenge kill it with ease. But that aside, it's almost always going to be able to pick off at least one kill. It's really strong, so yeah, huge power does that. Unfortunately, the nature didn't save. I, I would run adamant. You're already out running things like Magirna and um, Bisharp, so yeah. And it doesn't have the worst bulk. 85, 77, 77 is, is serviceable for a hyper offensive team. It's at least a bit bulkier than Mimikyu, I guess you could say, on the physical end by a lot. So yeah, that's cool. Of course, though, um, it, it's still all diggers B, so it's going to get killed by a lot of faster, stronger things, but. Um, if you find the right team for it, it's definitely serviceable. Quick Attack is a demon against a non-Dragapult, and Earthquake Fire Punch with Sword Dance just completely a, a one-shot machine. So against slower teams, it just devastates them. Even two kill unaware Quagsire, so that's cool. And you can run Mega Kick over Fire Punch if you don't mind being slowed walled by Corviknight and needing to two kill Fire Thorn instead of one to KO it. So yeah, just an option there. Of course, Mega Kick can miss though, so you gotta be careful. Next up, we have Gyarados, a Moxie Sweeper. Heavy Duty Boots, yeah, you can run Bounce or Ice Fang over Sub, I guess Taunt as well, but I like Sub to abuse Talk Specs. You could also run Intimidate to help give you more setup opportunities against things like Cinderace and Dragon Dragon Dragapult, I guess, but not really a big fan of that, honestly. You kind of got to pick your spots. I think Gyarados is not really great this generation. I mean, it just suffers. There's so many electric types, random electric moves. It lacks the one-shot power that it really needs a lot of support. And even at plus one, Scarfers can kind of nuke it. So yeah, it's probably best with Screens or Veil, honestly. Just because rocks don't do enough justice to it when it can just sub and boost up because it has decent natural bulk with 95 HP and 100 special defense. So, yeah, I just some quick observations. I haven't really seen Gyarados thrive this generation, but, you know, you have one waterfall flinch or one, you know, timely substitute and a toxic away from potentially going off. So, definitely some possible sequences you could provoke that would allow it to get a lot of damage out. Alakazam is kind of like uh, on hyper offense. I mean, it's just so frail that priority moves, even behind Veil, can take it out from decent heights. You still run the 28th defense for Bandit Azumarill and Hippowdown's Earthquake, but that aside, you just run a standard set. It's probably more likely to run Dazzling Gleam for Urshifu or 
shadow ball for opposing psychic types just because recovery on hyper offensive teams it's giving you know defargus free turn to come in so kind of kind of productive but you can also still run recover especially if you have bishop supports so abuse those pokemon and you want to come in repeatedly on tox specs and not my toxic spikes which is kind of the one like saving grace because i'm on hyper offense i'd say so that plus natural speed can go a long way i just don't think it's a long enough way to justify it as like a consistent option on these teams so yeah um next off we have x cloud x cloud is a great option if you're not minding Chansey, it's so laughably strong with Specs Boom Burst, and you can run Sleep Talk to absorb sleep from Amoongus, which is cool. And Fire Blast and Focus Blast are great coverage for Steel types because you're hitting Ghost types with Scrappy. So yeah, I mean, there's a ton of upside there, but there's also some downside. You're outrunning Adamant Crawdon and Modest Magirno, and also things like Choice Pantranitar, um, Slow Mandibuzz, etc. with this speed, Max Speed Aegislash, and Primarina, which is cool if they don't run Plus Nature. So yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of positives here, but Again, you have pretty poor physical defense despite 104 HP, only have 63, so you're still dying to certain things. So it's really good with webs, though. I definitely would recommend trying it out. Next up, we have Savali Ghost, which I just think is cool because you can trade with things like, you know, Hippowdon and Mandibuzz with enough, you know, little dents in them beforehand, and you have enough bulk to live most non, um, non super effective hits as well, naturally, which is cool. 95, 95, 95 bulk is great for hyper offense, and unfortunately, Urshifu outruns it, which is kind of unfortunate, but at least you can get away with running Adamant and Flame Charge, so. Yeah, it was cool. You kind of used to set up. You, you nuke things like mana buzz plus two with boom, or you boom and die dragon to so get that out of the way, or say you live a dark pulse for my dragon if it's not life orb as well. And you could um, also nuke things like your power down, tax specs with boom, and then you could use other Pokemon. So it's kind of a supporter. It's not really an outright win condition, but you can potentially go vice versa, use those things to support you, and then sweep with it, I guess. So it goes either way. It's really a fringe pick at best, though, just because it doesn't do much, you know, defensively, it doesn't have priority, it doesn't have speed, and it's not like a great check to anything. So. It's kind of fringe, but you can fit on really particular teams like the one I used the other day. And lastly, we have Scizor. Um, I guess the dual priority set's my favorite right now. Um, quick attack lets you with things like Volcarona, Rotom Heat, Cinderace, which is really cool. You can run Psychic, Psycho Cut for, Sciz for uh, Toxpex and Amoongus as well, I guess. And I think Superpower is pretty much needed for Steel types like Corbinite, Exedrill, Opposing Scizor, um, Parathorn, etc. So yeah. Um, I think it's like a fringe pick at best, but it could be cool with like Spell Spock, Spikes, Mew, I guess. And then just mow through offensive teams with the dual priority. So there's definitely some merit there as well. Anyway, um, next up, we're going to go into potential matchups that could be problematic to your team. Um, so first off, I want to discuss these Pokemon. Um, Hatterene is great against Mew and Trachyon and Shuckle. It just shuts them down with Magic Bounce. Although Trachyon can threaten it with Stone Edge, so you got to be careful, but it can just draining kiss back and to kill you or kill you if the sash is broken so yeah extra is kind of one exception to this another reason to use extra because mold breaker stealth arc goes through and it could threaten it with earthquake or if it doesn't run steel beam then iron head or swords dance so yeah a lot of plus side there for sure excuse me um also this coverage is like impossible to wall with hyper offensive teams like if you go with another pokemon it hits pretty much everything for two kr if offensive or it just if it's defensive it lives more hits so yeah um also gotta be wary of Trick Room variants because that can completely turn the tables on you. Trick Room in general is a problem. I'm not gonna get to delve into for upper offensive teams, but if Trick Room gets set enough times and you don't have enough priority, then those teams can be really problematic, especially since everything's running max HP to help shrug off priority moves since you want to be slower. So yeah, Trick Room is kind of like the anti-hyper offense, hyper offense. It's weird to put it, but weather teams kind of take the cake for that a bit more as they're more consistent in the metagame. Rain teams are just able to completely destroy you due to having faster Pokemon like Barascuda and Kingdra and Rain, which they're just going to kill through your entire team. You really don't run great water resist, so Rain teams pretty much always beat you. Um, there's no real getting around that unless you can like sweep them with Azumarill, I guess, potentially. Um, but even then, you got to chip the Kingdra. So, yeah, um, you got to be careful there. Psychic Train nukes your priority, a big lifeline that you have against a lot of those offensive teams. You saw me face hyper, uh, Psychic Train team twice the other day with Hyper Offense, and that was just completely dire. So you're pretty much another auto-lose condition. Honestly, the thing is that Hyper Offense is amazing upside, but also has these like really bad the ba bad um, potential downsides if you face the wrong matchup. So you gotta be careful with when you use it. That's why like laddering up with Hyper Offense in the lower ladder is amazing, but using it on the higher ladder, it's just not super sustainable, unfortunately. So gotta be careful there. Next up, we have Imposter Ditto with a Scarf. Um, it's just honestly, it, it completely invalidates your hyper offense because it could come in and kind of take the place of any of your revenge killings kind of sweeper Pokemon and just be quicker than them and just try and counter sweep your team. And you don't have amazing answers to their your sweepers because you're running hyper offense yourself. So it's like shit, like they got me. And that's that. But with Sticky Web, um, it doesn't actually affect it. Oh crap, because you absorb the stats of the other Pokemon. Yeah, so 
Hazard can at least chip it, and then if you have priority on that Pokemon, like Cinderace, you can potentially revenge kill it before it revenge kills you. But Ditto is still a really great tool against Hyper Offense to fix its spots well. So, yeah, watch out for the Counter Sleep. Talk Specs in general, because status is really annoying to switch into repeatedly. Um, but Toxic Spikes really takes the cake. Toxic Specs is a great answer to some Hyper Offensive cores and also just crippling them in general. It even sometimes takes two Pokemon to take out, two to Regenerator. So, yeah, but Toxic Spikes is kind of like Arch Nemesis number one for Hyper Offensive teams. I could even argue to run it. I'll put it above Ditto, I'd say, yeah. Probably even higher, honestly. But yeah, um, Toxic Packs is just great. Toxic Packs is really hard to remove. You don't have, like, Spin Drill. And even then, preserving that's hard. But it's going to hit at least three or four Pokemon on your team to just cripple them permanently. So that's a major problem. Toxic Spikes plus, like, Specs, Hex, Dragapult is really great against Hyper Offensive teams that lack Sticky Web because you could just status them all and then outrun them all and kill them all. So that's a cool core if you really want to do well against Hyper Offense in a lazy way without, like, prepping for individual sweepers. So yeah, that's cool. And then also Sand Rush Drill. It's going to be quicker and just devastate you offensively. Priority is good against it, like Aqua Jet from Azumarill, Grassy Glide from Rillaboom, which could also set up Grassy Drain to weaken Earthquake, but it's still mad strong against those teams. you got to be careful. It could revenge kill, like your Volcarona, Zero Aura, Maguna, etc. So, yeah, you got to be careful, but there are some outs against it, at least, unlike these other Pokemon where Toxic Spikes, Rain, or Psychic Drain teams, just forget about it. You're done. So, yeah, it's good, but not amazing. I guess there are better things as we listed, but there are also worse things that are still decent against it, such as Sun Team's um, a bit less foolproof than Rain, because there's only one real Chlorophyll abuser in Venusaur, and it is weak to things like Priority um, on Bishock or Cinderace. Not like weak, weak, but like it takes like 40-50% at least, so you could do that, especially it's taking Life Orb damage, but also Dragon Bolt is able to resist Giga Drain, Sludge Bomb, and Weather Ball, which is cool. And yeah, I mean, Scarf Darm also does really well, but at least it's locked in a Fly Blitz and taking constant recoil. So you can potentially beat Sun Teams, it's just not super easy. You can at least suffocate Charizard, thankfully, so you're not going to see Charizard rampaging through Hyper Offensive Teams as much. Then there's Unaware Pokemon, another genre of kind of anti-setup sweepers, such as Quagsire and the infamous Unaware Clefable on my channel. So yeah, that's um, really threatening as well. Um, they obviously just naturally stop setup sweeps, so yeah, there's really not much more to it, I'd say. Then priority on Pokemon like Cinderace can be annoying, especially on fast Pokemon. Scarf Pokemon that aren't grounded, so they're not taking spikes of any capacity or sticky webs. Scarf Hydra Dragon is just amazing against Hyper Offense. Unfortunately, it's completely shit against every other type of team just because it's so easily walled. But yeah, against Hyper Offense, it can kind of pick you apart. I tend to like running um, Flamethrower plus Dark Pulse, but you could also run um, Flamethrower or Dark Pulse plus Defog to get rid of things like webs or other hazards as well. And um, Iron Defense Como can kind of counter sweep you. If you don't, if you give it a couple too many free turns, because with Iron Defense, you can't kill it on the physical defensive side, and Body Press just does so much damage, and you could Earthquake things like Dragapult as well. So, yeah, you gotta be careful of that, but you can potentially suffocate it before it can suffocate you, if that makes sense. So, there's definitely some kind of pros and cons, especially since Toxic is so needed. Toxic and Poison Jab and Taunt are just better options in general in the last slot, but Iron Defense is good if you're scared of Piper Offense, that's for sure. It's amazing how fat it can get and how strong body press can get. So that is something to keep in mind as well as we're almost at 50 minutes. So we're only going to get one sample battle in. And I'm not going to build a team in front of you guys, but I'm going to go through my thought process. So this is a hyper offensive team I built considering all these potential options that we can take and use. Um, and it's also a team I feature in the live later today. So I wanted to use lead extra drill. So right off the bat, I'm like, okay, lead extra drill for sure. But also, I want to have Bisharp on the team because it can take advantage of Defoggers. I feel like Bisharp is still close to staple, staple status in the metagame, which is really cool. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, coming on Defog, you get plus two, etc. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to throw in Black Glasses Bisharp. Um, that's really great. And um, next off, we have um, Cinderace. So, Cinderace, um, I wanted to use it because it has another priority user, but also it's pretty fast. It's faster than things like Urshifu. So that's amazing. And Zen Headbutt coverage is really great for Toxic Specs. Toxic Specs, it's just kind of a core breaker. And the fact that I have Bisharp, and I know I'm going to be using things to help Chip Slowbro later on, makes me pretty okay with this as well. Since also, one of these, Cinderace or Bisharp, can help break a Powdown, because at plus two or plus one, they're able to kill it, since it's Adamant Cinderace. And then the other can break it at plus one or plus two, respectively, later on. So yeah, it's just kind of like a breaking core, if you will. And then um, also, I knew I wanted another fast Pokemon, so I threw in the Dragapult. Um, which is just great because also it could lure in things like Scizor, Ferrothorn, Corviknight, Magirna, Skarmory, etc. Which these Pokemon can potentially struggle with. And Dragon Dash is great against also Special Walls predicting you to be that special variant. So it's pretty cool in general. And also it's able to give you an immune to close combat which can kind of shit on the rest of the team. So that's cool too I guess. And a spin blocker and a pinch. If you really need that desperate but I don't think you really need that that much. But yeah. 
Um, then I wanted to finish off the team with Grassy Terrain Rillaboom because it gives you another priority user. And also with the Swords and Two Turn set, it could sort of great for the last Pokemon. A ground immunity um, in Halucha. Initially, I was considering using No Grassy Terrain with this Togekiss plus another Breaker as the last two Pokemon to give you that ground immunity. But ultimately, Halucha seemed like the best pick. So yeah, this spread lets you outrun Exodrill. So if you're running facing Sandrill and you're both at plus two due to you having a burden and them having sand, you'd be quicker than it. And then you could sub up on things like Pact, which you always get to Scald of with the spread and just Swords Dance and destroy them to Oblivion. So now we're gonna go ahead and pause and find either a battle or a replay that I could show you guys a sample of this team being used. Okay guys, this is a sample replay that is actually gonna be featured in my live later today, but I wanted to go over it because it's a really good example of how we could play Hyper Offense and also it was a really tight game. So right off the bat, we're facing a pretty bulky team, which is really good because we could showcase how we could use one break and break through another. Because if you look at the team preview right off the bat, Halucha's not breaking through with a Fall Health Clefable and Corviknight. Rillaboom's not breaking through with a Corviknight and Togekiss and Tangrowth there no matter what. Dragapult needs Chip on the Fairy types and Tangrowth to break through in general, but also if it's a specialty defensive Corviknight, it's being walled regardless. Bisharp can't break through a Corviknight and also, Toad is able to Revenge Guild, and Tangrowth can potentially sleep it and level any plus to hit. And Cinderace is definitely not breaking through Seismitoad or Milotic. And by the way, Mr. Sandaconda is a subscriber and a supporter, so if you're watching this, bro, big shout out. I know um, might not be um, a game you want to be showcased because you lose this game. I ultimately do win the game, but thank you so much for the support. And that goes for all you guys. Thank you for the support, if you're still watching especially. Um, but yeah, so right at the bat, I'm like, okay, I can't break with any one of them, but let's find a game plan to use one Pokemon to break for another. So this is a good example. So I lead with my extra lead at Rocks Up, but I see he's leading Seismitoad. That means he wants to, you know, trade basically Rocks. He doesn't mind the fact he's not going Corviknight, which I find weird. I think I'd lead Corviknight in this matchup, predicting the drill and just try and chip it right off the bat. But um, because of that, I know that weakening the Seismitoad helps a ton for Bisharp and Cinderace and potentially even Halucha if I can't get a Sewer Stamps up. So because of that, I go for Earthquake turn one, and he reveals to be offensive Seismitoad, which honestly makes some sense with like Milotic and whatnot. So I get a big amount of chip off there, and then I get Rocks up here, which is just amazing. So that's a good start. And now I want to go to Cinderace to keep the pressure up, because I know there are hard wells and everything else, but if I could chip through Milotic, that opens up the door for Dragapult, Bisharp, and Halucha as well. So I'm fine just going for a uh, Zen Headbutt here, and if he went to Milotic, I would actually go for the bulk up on it. But yeah, thankfully he didn't. Now he goes Clefable, which is kind of bizarre as I go Pyro Ball and I do 51% here. And he's Thunder Waves. Now I guess this means it's especially defensive Milotic because they can get two healed by a high jump kicker. Potentially Zen Headbutt at plus one. So yeah, I bulk up here now knowing he's going to softball up three Thunder Waves me. And now I miss a Zen Headbutt trying to um, potentially hit the Milotic because he'd be quicker than me. And he goes for Moonblast. And now I'm like, okay, I'll just go Pyro Ball. That's fine. I do 66% here. He Moonblasts again. Um, so I'm just like, okay, I'll, I'll take this trade here. It only really helps for Dragapult, but it's fine. But I miss, and he softballs, unfortunately. Now, I don't know why I didn't um, switch to my Milotic at any point here, but I'm fine with this. Um, Wounblast there, it's 21, and I think I try to take it out here, but I get parried as he takes me out ultimately. So that's like, okay, big setback. I didn't get much out of my Cinderace, but I did weak. I did kill the Seismitoad, and this is chipped, and I have rocks up. So I can still do a lot with these four Pokemon. It's just a matter of if I can string it together to find a way to win with them. So I'm like, okay, Dragon Ball Steel Wing always kills given the Pyro Ball damage. So I'm going to go to that because this Pokemon is the best breaker. And I'm like, okay, this lives a Steel Wing, this lives a Fire Blast, and this, if it has any special bulk, lives a Fire Blast as well. But I can do a lot of damage to all of them. So I put myself in kind of like a situation where I'm not sweeping right off the bat, but I am going to be able to force a position where I can make progress, which the other three Pokemon can abuse. Sometimes using these win conditions as breakers, shifting the role in the middle of the battle, being adaptable to that, and the opponent and how they're playing is the most important skill for hyper offensive players. And in a way, it makes such a linear play style way more complicated than you could imagine. So yeah, um, let's see what I could do here. Um, he goes Tangrowth right off the bat and he didn't expect a, a special a mixed variant, I guess. So I go Fire Blast and I take it out and that's huge because now Rillaboom looks a little bit better, but ultimately he still has his main checks and it was his least useful Pokemon remaining. He goes Corviknight and it's specially defensive. I'm like, oh damn. Iron Head crits me as well, so now I'm like weakened, and I did 50 with that, but then I roll min damage here. It was a favorable roll to Tokyo. I did get near max the first time, but that was absolute min, so that's unfortunate, I believe. Um, I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go Rillaboom now, preserve this for later, and I'm going to go ahead and try and claim a Swords Dance boosted knockoff on this. So I Swords Dance here as he just goes for the Defog to remove terrain, which is smart. 
And now I get the knockoff of it. Does 78 a plus two, because he's all specially defensive, which is amazing. So now this is in range for Halucha and Bisharp. So I've effectively done my job with these two. I now fire off Dragon Bolt here, and that's great. I um I can go to um I go Bisharp here at first, trying to get a kill here, but he flinches me. And I'm like, oh damn, now I'm in flamethrower range. I have nothing I can really do. It's just a rough matchup, but that confirms he's not Scarf. See, I thought this team was so slow that he really did need a Scarf, and honestly, he did. So this isn't the best team to face an example because the team's kind of incomplete. It's really, really slow, but that just makes it harder for me. So let's see if I can even overcome this. So what I do here now is I go to Rillaboom. I'm like, okay, I'm bulky Halucha given the spread we showed in the video. So there's a good chance I live a um, Air Slash given the damage done on Bisharp because I am bulkier than Bisharp in 29, so... Multi times four because resistant is super effective, then yeah, it would do a bit over 100 if I'm the same bulk, but I'm not. So I switched into here and it draws in my favor, and thankfully I do live. And now it's just a matter of since he revealed before that he wasn't physically defensive my Lottie because he didn't come in on Cinderace or anything else before, can I kill it with a plus two close combat? Acrobatics is going to kill this, close combat is going to kill the Corviknight, and thankfully I was able to do it. So despite getting really unlucky and facing things at wall every single Pokemon, you can use your Pokemon to synergize together and win the game. In ways like this it's a kind of systematic takedown of these balance scores with hyper offense just completely overwhelming them in the long haul that you're really able to abuse so yeah guys that about does it we went over different pokemon that can be used in hyper offense as leads different pokemon that can be used in hyper offense as potential breakers and win conditions potential problems to the hyper offensive archetype and also a sample team and a replay with that let me know your thoughts on hyper offense let me know your thoughts on metagame mondays did you enjoy this or do you prefer other type of content? Do you think that I should keep going every single week? And also on top of all that, be sure to leave a like, comment your thoughts, and subscribe to my channel, guys. I've put a lot of work into this. I think we've been doing great stuff. A lot of people are learning from this channel, and I feel like we're doing great to build a sense of community. And there might also be a Discord server for my channel coming up, guys. So stay tuned for future Metagame Mondays and also other videos like this and covering SSAU as well. Hope you enjoyed. Have a great day, guys. Peace.